Well, good morning, Life Point. How are you? It's good to be back with you guys. It's been a while. So I'm Lee. It's so great to have an opportunity occasionally to be up here and to celebrate with you. That's fantastic, the stuff that, that God is doing and impacting. Sometimes we get spoiled. So I come from an outside perspective. You guys are in it here at Life Point. I just want you to know, like, this kind of impact that a church has should be happening everywhere doesn't happen everywhere. So uh, consider, consider yourself humbly proud of what you guys are able to accomplish and what's going on here in the community. Just love it so much. I'm not really quite sure why um, I come here from Vegas and I come here to cool down. So I was actually with all of Bellevue at the mall yesterday trying to get air conditioning happening. So that's really exciting. But uh, just appreciate so much being with you guys. Um, speaking, speaking of cooling down, a few weeks ago, and literally I mean a few weeks ago. Sometimes preachers get up and say a few weeks and it's like a few years. But literally a few weeks ago, I got up early on a Sunday morning like this. And I did a cup of coffee, Keurig, don't judge. And I went outside and was just sitting. My wife was still sleeping. My daughter, my adult daughter was visiting us, was in the guest. They were all sleeping early Sunday morning. It's, a, it's cool enough to be outside. So I'm sitting there just pondering life and whatever. And I had left the door just slightly ajar to our backyard because I have this fear that I'm going to lock myself out of the house. Makes no sense, but anyway. And out of the corner of my eye, peripherally, I see something black fly by and make a left turn with intention into our house through the open door. And so I did what every guy would do. I just sat there for a few minutes and pondered what my next move should be. Because let's be honest, I don't know if you've ever had anything in your house. Probably a lot of you have something. Generally, it's something small and you know, you're bigger than it is, but it doesn't matter. It's still just freaky, right? Like something's in the house. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it is. And it's my responsibility to try to find it and flesh it out. So after a few minutes, I got up from my chair, left my coffee. I went inside. I'm assuming this is a bird, which is a reasonable assumption. And so I opened both doors, opened the back door where I was wide, opened the front door, because my plan is I'm just going to locate this thing and, and set it free. But before I did that, I decided that the best move I could also make was to close off any extra space, like limit the space we were going to do battle in. So I went to the master bedroom where my wife was sleeping. She's still asleep. And, I, and I'm going to close the door, right? So I go to close the door. Literally, I'm making this motion. I'm reenacting it for you. Lean in. And so I pull the door shut. And as I pull the door shut, I look down. And it's on my chest, just stuck there, just doing this. And I was calm. I just screamed as loud as possible and moved my shirt and ah, did this. And my wife sat up straight out of bed and started screaming as well, not knowing what she was screaming about. And I'm like, there's something in the house. I thought it was like a moth. Right? So I'm like, this is moth. And she comes out and she's screaming and it's flying around. She's like, it's a bat. And I grab the broom, my weapon of choice, and I'm whacking at this thing and it's freaking out and we're freaking out. And uh, I'm putting holes in the wall, literally two small dents from the broom missing. Finally, after a minute or two, I whack it enough that it's, it's okay, it survived. Out the door it goes. Listen, folks, I had a bat on my stomach. Okay? I don't know where it came from. I don't know where I picked it up possibly on my walk over. She believes, her theory is that the bat was actually in her room. And then when I went to close the door, it came out. Okay, here's the funny thing about that story, even telling it this morning. It's freakier now telling it than actually in the moment living it. Right? There's something about fear, but it's the, the, it's, it's the idea of something that's more fearful than when you're actually experiencing it. Um, don't get me wrong, it was freaky, but you're just responding to that fear or that experience in the moment. And then when you think back on it, you're like, there was a bat on my chest looking at me. Okay. But here's, what, here's, what fear, here's where fear gets us. Is fear like that, in a way... That bat stuck to my chest is sort of how fear can get stuck to our lives, especially as followers of Christ. Like, it can really freak us out. Fear can, fear can cause us to lose perspective. Fear can force us to lose traction in our life. Fear can have us make bad decisions. Fear can also stop us from making any decisions. That's what fear can do to us. And as followers of Christ, or if you're watching today, you're at home or you're here in the room, and you're even considering following Christ, 
Fear can take on a number of forms, but the thing I want to talk to you about today is that we often, what often gets stuck in us is the actual fear of being exactly in the center of where God wants you in your life. That can be a fear that a lot of us actually live with every day. And so the, the, the way that I would describe that centering is a word that we use in Christian circles. It's the word calling, calling. This isn't a word that you use out in your normal life. It's like you don't go to Boeing and go, it's my calling. Like we may use it a little bit, but this is really kind of a Christian word. And we say it in the church, we say like calling. And then, then here's the problem with this word. We usually attribute this word to professional Christians, right? Like me, right? Or like Rusty or like Doug. It's people that like, that is their calling. I think that's completely hijacking this word. I think I'm looking out at a bunch of folks, talking to a bunch of folks today that actually have a calling. And it may even be a calling I know, that's more important than those that stand on this stage or do ministry in the, in the, in the true form that we think. That all of us have a calling. But I'm going to suggest in the next few moments that your calling may be tucked away because of the fear that is stuck to you. And that we may need in this 2.0, let's just be honest, as we kind of move forward in our lives from this last season that's confusing and complex and weird and strange, there may be a 2.0 you that God wants to recenter you and actually identify or invite you in to that calling. And so to fully understand that, I want to take you to the shores of a lake. It's a lake called Genesaret. We know it as the Sea of Galilee. I want to take you there on a particular day. You may have heard this, this uh, narrative before. I want to invite you today to, not, to hear it anew, to hear it fresh, to kind of put yourself there. Right? You guys have lakes around here. We, don't have, we have Lake Mead, but it's going away. But the, we have, you guys have lakes here and all of that. And so, but picture, picture a more active, not like a recreational lake, but a lake, the Sea of Galilee, which would have been where fishermen would have, would have been, right? And they would have, they would have sat there and they would have, they would have mended their nets all day and they would have launched their boats every day from there and they would have come in with the fish of their... Picture that and picture that there's a lot of clamoring and noise and fishermen talk and probably language that you wouldn't want your kids to hear. And in the middle of all that, Jesus has stepped out and he's begun to teach and there's a crowd that gathers. And off to the side of this crowd as Jesus is teaching, Peter, Simon Peter, we've heard of him, is kind of sitting off in the distance, listening. Here's what it says. If you're following along, you've got notes. If you're watching online, it, it'll be there on your screen in front of you. It says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or we know as Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and they were listening to the word of God. I love that Luke, in, in hindsight, says Jesus was, he was basically teaching the word of God. I love that. Right? They, they wouldn't have known that. They weren't sitting there listening to the word of God. They were sitting there listening to this radical rabbi who was bringing this new good news like nothing they had ever heard before. And a crowd would always gather when he would teach. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their net. Side note, the lake of Gennesaret is, is considered, it is the lowest freshwater lake in the world. It's surrounded by hills and cliffs. It's very low. And I think it's interesting that Jesus would spend a lot of his ministry time at this low point. There's something metaphoric about that, right? We, 18 of his 33 recorded miracles took place in proximity to this lake. I think that's the way God is. Like, he kind of operates in our low points. I don't think that we should, it should be missed. Many of us would say, yes, that's true. Like, at this lowest or most challenging point in my life is where God intersected with me. And that's, that's what happened here. So here we are at the lake. There's a lot of activity. Jesus teaching. You're there, right? There's the smell of fish. There's the, the noise of fishermen and the crowd. And, and what we've learned is that Peter, we'll learn this in hindsight, Peter is dealing with failure. So Peter's perceived calling was fishing. It's what his family had done. It's what he, he had done. It's what he would do. His kids would do. It would just be generational. So he's sitting there and he has had a bad night out on the lake as he's listening to Jesus. And so the crowd is soaring. The shore is getting, the shore is getting full of people. 
And we read that Jesus needs a solution to be able to communicate better. So what he does is, it says in verse 3, he gets into one of the boats, the one belonging to Peter, Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Can I bring up something here? Jesus is the guy that later on would walk on water. So I just thought, reading this for the first time, I thought, couldn't he have just backed up onto the water? It would have been impressive too, right? Like if there were any doubters, like, you know, he would just back up and end up 15 feet out. He could have, but I think there's something significant for him asking Peter for permission to use his boat. I think there's something there because he didn't have to ask for permission, but God does that with us. God is a God who doesn't force himself upon us, that he invites us to participate with him and he leaves it up to us. And that can be frustrating. Sometimes we'd rather God just force himself. Sometimes like, I don't want all this choice. God, just tell me what to do and do it in my life. But that's not how God operates. That's not how he created us. And so Jesus steps into Peter's boat and says, will you push out a little so that I can communicate better with this crowd? He didn't, he didn't ask for, he didn't ask for this moment, Peter. He was just minding his own business, mending his nets. And Jesus stepped into his boat. I wonder for some of us, if we think about the boat of our lives, if we don't read this and sort of think about the idea that I'm not sure Jesus would want to step into my boat. Because on the last day of July 2022, my boat is messy. My boat is complicated. My boat is unclear. Oh, and this one. That guy's boat up the street is way better than mine. Like, step into his boat. Like, he's got it together. He knows what's going on. That could be our reaction. And it may have been Peter's as well. Because Jesus didn't need Peter's boat, he needed his life. And Peter didn't know this was coming, but he needed Peter to surrender his life to what God had for him. And our calling is always defined by our obedience. When God invites us, when God encourages us, it really becomes up to us. Our calling is defined by obedience. And I get it. Listen, the shore, let me me be honest, the shore is safe. The shore is predictable, right? The shore is really familiar. I love that one. I love familiarity. It's routine. But if, but if Peter wanted to experience the fullness of the calling of Jesus, if he wanted to move from the was of just being a fisherman to the can be of really following Jesus into this new movement, he had to push out. He had to be obedient to the call. Now, let's be clear. When Peter said yes, Jesus got in the boat and he pushed out a little bit away from the shore. He really thought he was only going on a three-hour tour. He just thought, I'm loaning my boat out for three hours to this guy. I've got nothing else to do. I'm bored anyway. I've got no fish to clean. I'm not going out again fishing. He didn't know that he would spend the next three years with this crazy miracle worker, that he would see deaf ears that would begin to hear, eyes that would be open, dead individuals that would be raised. He had no idea. He just thought, sure, I'll push out. I'm bored. This should be interesting. He didn't really know the result. But if you're serious today about your life being in the center of where God wants it, if you're serious about the calling that God specifically has for you, then you're going to have to begin with obedience. Rusty talked about this a few weeks ago, the importance of obedience. And it comes up again in this story. So Peter pushes out a little away from the shore and Jesus continues his talk. We don't have a recording of the teaching, but imagine it's some of the teaching that Jesus always did. He probably told the parable of the Good Samaritan Maybe he talked about, blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. Be the salt of the earth. Be the light of the world. He's saying all this, and Peter's in the front of the boat just listening, just soaking it all up. But when Jesus was done teaching, Jesus wasn't done. It says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out, thanks for loaning me your boat, put out into the deep water. You've been on the shore, that's the was, We're a little bit here, kind of, we can see the shore, but now I'm going to invite you out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Basically, Jesus is like, I'm done teaching now, let's go fishing. Remember, Jesus was a carpenter, not a fisherman, 
wasn't an expert. And so Peter tries to be polite, figures Jesus doesn't know. He says, Master, we have worked all night and haven't caught anything. We got skunked, zero. And I love this next phrase. It tells you something about Peter and what we'll see as his life goes forward. He says, but because you say so, because you're calling me to do this, because you're asking me to do this, we will let down the nets. Here's a picture of me a few, uh, last year, last April, fishing. Don't I look like I know what I'm doing? I have no idea what I'm doing. I kind of have that look like, I'm not really sure. This is up in the Big, Bighorn Lake in uh, a Bighorn River up in Montana, way up in Montana. Well, I guess not way up. We're close to Montana here. And uh, I'm up there with my buddy Matt, and we're fishing off the boat. And we, do, we were out there all day. But I want you to notice the guy in the middle with, uh, that's actually doing all the work. That's Hunter, and Hunter was our guide. There was about 20 pastors that were up there, and everybody got assigned to a boat, and Hunter was there. And so we were learning how to fly fish, you know, so we were, you know, doing that and mending the line and all of that, and, and, and we, were, uh, we were really depending on Hunter to tell us where to go. It was really kind of cool, too. It was like bougie. So, like, if I would tangle my line, I would just sit down and drink something, and Hunter would undo it. It's kind of cool. But here's what I want you to know. What's interesting is there were a lot of these guides like Hunter, and they kind of had a competition. That's how fishermen are. And so when they set off in the morning with all of us in the boat, there was kind of this unspoken thing of like, which boat's going to come back with the most fish? we got all these rookie fishermen. Which, boat, which, which guide is going to do the best work? So Hunter wanted to catch fish, but Hunter did not have a pole. All he had was the oars. So he was guiding us all day to where he thought the fish were. Right? Because fishermen want to catch fish. So when Jesus said to Peter, put out into the deep, and Peter's like, we haven't caught anything, he, he was like Hunter saying, listen, we've been going up and down this river all day. I'll tell you what Hunter would do that was cool. When we would get into a stretch where we got some hits or we even caught some fish, you know what he would do? He would, what he called, re-row that area. He would literally take the boat and he would, it was a lot of work for him, not for us. He would strain and he would go back up a quarter mile or a half mile and he would refloat that area. And if we got more fish, he would refloat again because he didn't know if there were any more fish coming. And he wanted to catch as many fish as possible because that's what fishermen do. And here's Peter. He's tired. He's frustrated. He's been out all night. He caught nothing. He's already mended his fish. He's already, he's already mended his nets. He's cleaned everything up. He's prepped the boat for the next day. And this teacher, this carpenter, comes to them and says, listen, I know all that, but I want, to take, I want you to take your heavy boats. I want you to take your heavy nets. And I want you to go out in the deep water where there probably hasn't been any fish. It will be fun. Plus, People are watching. And when you follow your calling and people are watching and you, and, and you fail, it's embarrassing. It's the middle of the day. They're not even supposed to go out. Peter, what are you doing? So this is the pause. This, this is the pause in our story. And it's the pause in you and I's story. Because there's always a reason or a season where we will not walk fully in the identity, identity that God has for us. There's always a reason. There's always a season where we won't walk in that calling. It's time to stop with the excuses. It's time to take responsibility. This was that moment for Peter. We think think he had options because we know the story, but he could have bailed. He could have walked away at this moment. He really could have. Here's a picture. This is, uh, some of you know this. This is St. Peter's Basilica. It's built in the 16th century. 120 years to build this thing. It's like building a building in Pacific Northwest. It takes a long time (laughs) to get something built, right? It's built, in, it, the, the story is, is it's built over the burial grounds where Peter was buried, right? It's also built where what was called Nero's Circus, where they would persecute and torture Christians back in the Roman days, right? And it's, you can go see this. Do you think, again, do you think Peter knew when he decided to go fishing in the deep water that this was going to be the result? No. He didn't know there were going to be chapels and churches with his name on the side, and, and, and listen, if you follow your calling, you're not getting a basilica, okay? Maybe you will, but you shouldn't count on it, okay? That's not the point. My point is, this was the pause in the story where this was not going to happen. 
where Peter being the predominant voice of the first century church and Peter being the voice that we still listen to in his writings inspired in our New Testament scripture, this was not going to happen if Peter would have said, listen, Jesus, I'm going to push back to the shore. You're going to have to find another boat to take you out into the deep. I know we think that would never happen. Yes, because we all do it every day. We all do it all the time when Jesus says, push out into the deep, and we're like, not today, not today. This was the big pause in the story. Jesus is saying, trust me in this thing, this thing that is the center of your life, the center of your entire life that's been determined by. Will you trust me in this? That's what he's asking. So against their better judgment, they decide to humor Jesus, and before long, in verse six, it says this. When they had done so, They caught such a large amount of fish (laughs) that their nets began to break and they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Jesus kind of making a statement here. Here's what I think he's saying. He's saying, Peter, if you're just about fishing, I can take care of the fishing part. If your calling is just going to work every day, if your calling is just putting food on the table or a roof over your family's, if that's, I can, that's, come on. He's saying, if you want me to do that, I can overload your boat. I can pour all of that out. Because they hit the mother load. <clears throat> all their expectations. It's like Peter pulled the mega bucks lottery ticket out of his pocket and hit all the numbers. And there, I just picture them. I, I don't know what was going on, but I just picture them and the both boats and they're basically rolling in fish like dollar bills. And they're just like, this is amazing. And Peter's thinking, this is my future. He's saying, wait till I tell my wife, like we're going to that European vacation, right? We're going to Egypt. We're going to buy that RV. We're going to buy a fleet of boats. Because with Jesus as my partner... If he can make these fish happen, we're going to do really, really well. And the, people, and the, fish guy, the guys in the boats are laughing and they're just having a great time. And in that moment, just, I just picture it this way, that suddenly Peter kind of looks over and kind of sees where Jesus is and their, their eyes meet. Their eyes meet. And in that moment... Peter saw this he cried out and he said we are rich we won't have to work for weeks and immediately Peter offered Jesus a seven-year contract 30 percent ownership and a non-compete agreement it's not it sorry that's not what verse 8 says it says when he looked over it says suddenly Peter realized something that Jesus calling was not to join Peter but that Peter's calling was to join Jesus. I don't know what he saw in Jesus' eyes, but he saw something that was intimidating. His purpose was not to enhance Peter's career, not not to enhance his reputation or thicken his wallet. He sees all of that in Jesus' eyes at that moment. He He realizes that Jesus did not simply come to fill up his nets and to fill up his boat, but that what was coming was walk away, let go, release everything. What was coming was this word, follow. Because follow always is partnered with calling. Our calling is discovered when we follow. And that was what was coming. And so suddenly fish are the furthest thing from Peter's mind. And in the story, he face plants in front of Jesus sort of preemptively. And he says, he fell at Jesus' feet, at his knees. And he said, go away from me, Lord, because he knew what was coming. He said, I am a sinful man. Sometimes we define sin as far as behavior, and it is. But really, truly, sin at its macro level is really when we are going in an opposite direction, when we are acting or living out our lives opposite of God's desired intent. That's simply the definition. We, We think about it, and that's a sinful thing or sinful behavior. But really, at the core, it's this is God's direction for our lives, and we're choosing differently. And so Peter was basically saying, I'm a sinful man. I have not chosen God's way in any way, shape, or form. Jesus, you do not want to be around me. Like, you need to leave. And I think he did that because he recognized Jesus' agenda was not his agenda at all. And he assumed that maybe if he declared himself a sinner, God would want to distance himself. But what he didn't realize is Jesus' new message, when he said the kingdom of God is here, one of the prerequisites was that you were a sinner. 
Because if you were a sinner, then Jesus would step into that and he would change and he would mold that. That was this brand new gospel, this good news. And Peter himself in the near future would become the, the number one communicator of this good news and the first leader of this movement that would eventually be called what you and I know as Christianity. And Peter somehow knew this. He knew that somebody's got to leave. Either Peter leaves everything and walks away and follows or Jesus leaves Peter. It's the bottom line. And listen, I'm much more comfortable like you are with the God who fills up my boat and then leaves. When I have a need and God meets that need, I'm like, cool, good, awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you next time. Right? I'm much more comfortable with that. But when God says, no, follow, that makes me more uncomfortable. So Jesus looks him in the eye and picks him up and says, don't be afraid. And he would Constantly say that to his followers in the next few years, right? Do not be afraid. Don't push your fear of following your calling away. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up to the shore, left everything, and what? Followed him. Calling is this. It's simply following, following defined by our obedience. Obedience plus following equals calling. That we determine to follow and we walk obediently every day and that's our calling. Peter was a fisherman. That was his was. In that moment, he was a fisherman with a lot of fish in the boat. That was his is. But his can be was this, was this invitation that Jesus gave him to become more than just a, someone who fished a lake but actually changed the world. And listen, our comfort may be keeping us from our calling. We like being comfortable. I know we do. It's okay. I like being comfortable. You like being comfortable, right? When it's hot, I like to turn the air down to 65 degrees, right? You guys are crazy up here. Don't put air conditioning in your houses. We like comfort. We often associate the presence of God with how comfortable you are, right? When I'm more comfortable, that means God is, likes me. And when I'm not, it may mean he's not happy with me. That's the furthest thing from the truth. Sometimes our calling will make us the most uncomfortable, in this season. So what's your next step? What, you're like, Lee, that's great, it's great talk. What are you called to? I have no idea. But you do. You do. Right? You do. And we're in this great season. Some people have called it the great resignation. I prefer to call it the great reorganization. We're coming out of this pandemic and everything that we've experienced is so complex and all that, that a lot of people are just kind of looking at their lives and kind of thinking, what does that next season need to look like? I think it's amazing, right? It's like you 2.0. What does God want to do, right? And that's your calling. That's, that's discovering anew my calling. What do I need to do that's significant? For some of you, your calling right now is to just get back to or start pointing your life toward God. Right now you're listening to this and you have never been or you are at a distance from God and the calling for you over the next season is to get back into that close relationship and you're in the right place to help you do that. But that, that may be your calling for this next season. For some of you, you're single and there may be a calling to moral purity, right? We're living in a culture that's so crazy, sexuality so out of control that maybe there's a biblical moral purity that you've been called to live out that's a hard calling where you're going to have to be obedient and following him to live that out, maybe. I don't know what your calling may be. For some of you, some of you, you may be, your calling may be that you're going to get invited away from your current occupation. And listen, don't go home, Lee told us all to quit our jobs. Don't do that, right? But I'm challenging some of you because some of you, I just said that and some of you are thinking it. You haven't even told your spouse yet. You're doing your thing every day and it's putting the roof over your head and putting the food on the table and you're like, I hate this. I hate it, I hate it. It's not my calling. It's not what God wants me to do. I need to be doing this. But you're quiet about it and you're not being obedient. Some of you need to be radical in this next season that God's saying, listen, it's time for you to turn and pivot and do something else that's significant. Okay, again, Easy, not all of you, but some of you, I just want to confirm that God may be doing that in you. That you may, be, you may get called away from your occupation into something that God has for you. Now, some of you, it's simply this. You just need to invite Jesus. Your calling is you need to invite Jesus into your occupation. That you've compartmentalized for too long. 
But tomorrow when you wake up and you go do that thing, you need to begin to invite Jesus into every moment, into the conversations, in how you lead, the employer you are, the employee that you are, and all those things. Some of you, the way you parent needs to change because that's your calling. The way, you, the way you love your neighbor needs to be redefined and reimagined. That's your calling. Again, I don't know what your calling is, but I think you need to have a conversation with God about it. God, what are you inviting me into in this next season? And how can I follow? And how can I be obedient? Some of you are bored with your faith. Can I just be honest? Like you're sitting here looking at your watch because you want to go to the Mexican restaurant and that's, you came to church for an hour and you're bored, right? It's fine. But you're not living out your calling. Some of you need to get uncomfortable with your faith again. You need to push out into the deep. Do something unusual that's going to stretch you and make it hard. Some of you, it's your stuff. It's the stuff in your boat. It's the nets that you have to kind of, you're going to have to filter through. You've been hoarding that stuff, and it's a barrier to what God has called you to be and do. A, a, few, a few months ago, I was in the break room at our church where I work, and they put a new TV in there and tried to jazz it all up, right? So it's cool. And I'm in there warming up my lunch, and on the TV is Bob Ross. Some of you don't know who Bob Ross is. Just hold on, right? So I'm watching this, and I'm like, this is the Bob Ross channel. Did you know Bob Ross has a channel? I know some of you are like, what? Like you literally, they just play Bob Ross painting over and over and over again. And you're laughing, but it's addicting, right? Here's Bob. So I, here's a picture. That you see, now some of you are like, oh, I know who Bob is, right? So if you're, old, if you're in my generation, you kind of grew up on Bob on public television. He would just paint for 30 minutes. And he would start with a blank canvas. And by the end of the 30 minutes, it would be like this complete painting and you would just be in awe. And so I started watching Bob. And so the next day I went into the break room, I turned it over to the Bob Ross channel and people are starting to come in and they're like, Lee, what are you watching? And then they sit down and we're eating our Chipotle and they're like, this is cool, right? And Bob's like, oh, let's just do a little tree up here, right? Just a little bit. And then we're going to put a little bit. And he's just amazing. But here's, here's, I was thinking about this message. I was thinking about Bob. This is you and I, if we think about how God is, is working in our lives. Let me explain. So this, this picture looks really cool, but you didn't watch the creation of it. You didn't, you, know, you, didn't, you didn't see how it manifests itself. But I'll warn you that I know in this picture that, that obviously it was a blank canvas. And Bob always paints from the background to the foreground. So you're watching and you're thinking, what is he doing? Oh, it's mountains. Oh, it's snow. Oh, there's a little path that we're going to put here. And then it, it always comes this direction. It's what I call layers. And it's layers that then reveal the holistic picture of what is supposed to be there. And what we see then is beautiful and it's significant. And it's, it's, it's something you want to stop and look at. And guys, that's how God's calling works in your life. So when you're sitting there today thinking, I have no idea, I would say to you, just begin to allow God to paint on the canvas of your life. When you don't know what to do, do what you know. And you already know what to do. You already know how to begin to step out. And God will reveal the rest of it, right? As he invites you to leave the boat and to begin to walk with him. And then he's gonna layer, 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 layer upon your life. And he's gonna reveal things that you never knew. And he's gonna reveal opportunities and things that you're gonna be a part of that you never expected. And someday you're gonna look back on your life and you're gonna go, because I was not, because I pushed away from the, from the season that I thought I was in that I couldn't be in God's plan. Because I pushed away from the reasons that I would convince myself I couldn't be in God's plan. I was able to reveal the picture and the identity of who God wanted me to be. Don't doubt it. God wants to work that way in your life, right? He wants to work that way in my life and in your life. And you don't know what hangs in the balance of your decisions. And it's all different for all of us. You guys have been in Romans chapter 12. Rusty's been taking you through that. There's a verse in Romans chapter 12 that says this. It says that each of us, just, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. Can I put my word in there? Sorry, Paul. Do not have the same calling, right? But we're all part of the same picture. Right? We serve a purpose. So in Christ, we though many form one body and each member belongs to the other. That when we all follow our calling, it makes this unit, the church, and then multiplied through, through people that are serving God in so many ways and following their calling, it makes for a movement. 
a kingdom of God that becomes the light of the world and the salt of the earth that's changing for all of us, impacting the world. We can be that. And God wants that for us. We're going to close out our time by doing communion because it fits with this perfectly. So you should have got um, communion as you came in. If you didn't, um, we have it. Our guys have it here. So just lift your hand up and they'll bring it to you. If you're watching at home, you can grab some crackers, maybe a little juice. We'll give you just a second to be able to do that so that you can participate virtually with us in communion. And I'll give you guys just a second in the room to figure out how to get the cracker out. It's part, of, it's, it's part of the challenge of communion. Just act. I'm not sure Jesus would have had communion with his disciples if it would have been this tough. Here's what's cool. So Jesus was with his disciples, and can I tell you this? Guess who was there? Peter, James, John. Those guys that left their nets, they're sitting around the table three years later. And Jesus takes bread and he breaks it and he blesses it and he gives it to them and says, this is my body which is broken for you. In other words, I'm now going to live out ultimately what my calling is. And my calling is to not only take care of your sin problem, but also to provide access to God in ways that you've never experienced before through my body being broken. And so he says, take and eat. So very prayerfully, life point, let's partake of the bread together today. also says he took a cup this would have been a normal part of their meal but in this case Jesus took the cup and he said this cup is a little different today because it represents my blood and a new covenant right that would that would begin with in this moment a new relationship that you're going to have with your heavenly father and every time you drink this cup you remember it until I'm together with you again so today very prayerfully let's do that together father we are in awe that you would partner with us and invite us into a relationship with you. I pray for LifePoint as a body, as an as a entity that is reaching and transforming this community. But I also pray for every individual that's watching or in a seat today. God, that you would work in them, identifying their calling, layering on what your Holy Spirit wants to do in them as they grow and walk in you. God, I pray for the discouraged today, that they would be encouraged. God, I pray for those that need hope today, that you would give them an, an exceeding abundance of joy and hope. That God, you have a plan for them, a direction, a, a, a deep water experience that you have for them. God, help us to be what you want us to be, to put aside every excuse, every barrier. God, that we would push aside the fear that would want to stick to us and that we would walk completely in what you have for us. God, that's our desire. We pray in your name. Amen.